Hey everybody, and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, the apartment courtyard across which you spy on us while we watch 100 of the greatest movies of all time. I'm Clint Gage. With me, as usual, grizzled war photographer Alex Stedman. Hello. How's it going, Alex? It's good. I'm excited to talk about this one. How are you, Clint? Yep, I'm, I'm hanging in there. Yeah. And of course, also joining you there live in person uh, is the man who's made of nothing but diegetic sound, Michael Calibro. Cal, what's happening? How's it going, Clint? It's going. It's going. I feel um, I, being remote while you guys are sitting there next to each other is a, is a little bit uh, lonely. I mean, it's very yeah. perfectly. It's honest. very apropos of the movie. We're I, I, to watch. We both feel like exactly. players. I feel like you're looking at us I, and we're looking at you. Yeah. Oh. So on my monitor, I've taped little like a little mat, like a binoculars mat, around you guys, so that I'm looking at you through my. Oh, we have know, cur we have curtains ones, around you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. It's we built great. a whole building. Um, yeah. Well, so in case these in case these clues aren't enough as to what movie we're talking about this week, our season two adventure continues uh, in community with the movie that I, I think actually nails the theme of community better than any of the ones that we've talked about so far. It's not just about a community like doing something or banding together or something like that. Like, I feel like there's a statement being made about this particular community in in low these modern times of the mid 1950s uh but we are talking about alfred hitchcock's rear window from 1954 starring james stewart and grace kelly as pair of looky loos uh just keeping tabs on the residents of their uh, greenwich greenwich village apartment building it's greenwich right that's what I, we're I, supposed I, to yeah, yeah no yeah because she lives on the upper east. New, new york somewhere she, she yeah. seems to I feel like she's living on the Upper East Side, and this is definitely the village. I don't, I don't well, know that we. Got, this is Lower Manhattan. Like a lot of info. Yeah, I don't know that we got a lot of. Well, yeah, no, they actually say Manhattan the address. Geography. They say so like think, nine, they, they say yeah. like Ninth Street. So like that's low. Okay, great. That's low. Yeah, I mean it's above Houston, um, but you know, still low. Still, it's pretty low. Uh, <laughs> so now that we got that sorted out, I think that'll do it. This is a good movie. We talked. We figured out where they are. We figured out it's pretty low, um, but no. I mean, so this is the first Hitchcock movie that we talked about, and I mean, Hitchcock movies. I feel like are a thing unto themselves, right? Like this is, they kind of have, I don't know. Pe they, there's a people have different. Fa flavors of Hitchcock that they like more than others and different era. Like he worked for so long and did so many incredible movies that there are different eras. Like, Oh, I'm a, I'm an early Hitchcock guy. I'm a black and white Hitchcock guy. Or like, um, show me an early Hitchcock. But guy. like we're talking like pre pre coming to America, Hitchcock guy, you know, like the side. Well, yeah. Like the original man who knew too much yeah. and the 39 steps and, and that sort of thing. Um, Whereas, like, I, I feel like this, I guess the 40s and 50s would count as sort of mid-period. It's definitely a romantic know, thriller I don't, I don't, period, I, feel I would like say. It's, it's pre-psycho. Yeah, yeah. I guess psycho is the beginning of his final period, and this is before that. Yeah. Right, exactly. It's it, in the vertigo like, I period. Think this is, but I, I would argue that this is uh, maybe the height of his powers in Rear Window, to be perfectly honest. Like, I, I, this movie's so good. <laughs> but like because he made this he made dial in for murder the same year to catch a thief was like six months after that uh a couple of years go by and he makes vertigo and north by northwest and, and psycho all in the span of something like 18 months like it's two years something like that and in vertigo north by northwest and psycho might be the most incredible two-year span for a God. filmmaker of all time i don't know man I, um i think but i i don't i don't think you'd be hard pressed to make a, a legit case for rear window not legitimately being better than all of them. i think that this is the highest hitchcock on my list and it, i think this is the move this is the hitchcock movie i've seen more than any other yeah. i loved revisiting it for a lot of reasons it is not even my second favorite hitchcock uh i put mm. i and i love it we're gonna talk about how much i love it but careful where you step here earlier today there was a guy we work with who had a oh. hot take in a meeting and he was so visceral. Go ahead and call him out by name. It's Tanner. It is Tanner. <laughs> Tanner had such a hot Tanner had such a hot take in a meeting where he said that Rear Window wasn't S tier Hitchcock and he was so viscerally skewered that he did subsequently and you know, credit where credit is yeah. due, he admitted he was wrong in Slack and apologized for his hot take. Which yeah. you know, he was it not, takes a big he was man not to so do proud that. as it to walk that back. It takes a big man to do it, now. but just if you're going to come hot at 
rear window. Come correct. <laughs> uh, I will say, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna come in that hot. It is probably my third favorite. I go. I go behind. Behind what? I go psycho, psycho and vertigo? vertigo. Yeah, rear okay. uh, North by Northwest is kind of like aiming for it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, North North by Northwest is a, is a strike. But see, this is what I'm talking about with Hitchcock movies. Like, I feel yeah. like they're they're you know, I don't know because North by Northwest has that that genre of like the regular guy mistaken identity mystery adventure. That's like kind of a, a subgenre of Hitchcock stuff. Um, well, but then. Oh, go ahead. My Tanner esque hot take is that all North by Northwest really left me with is like the sexual euphemism of the train entering the tunnel. That was sure. good, but it, but it even stuck that, with you. That was it to catch a thief, though, wasn't it? No. no, to catch a thief was the fireworks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is that was the the pan up to fireworks yeah. after they. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say I, after they knows, don't the, kiss. The man knows the man yeah. knows how to use a euphemism. Well, listen, the dude was a perv. Uh, <laughs> I think in a. In in a very well documented way, as far, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Uh, remember that year? It was like ten years ago now. I think there were like three Hitchcock biopics that just made him look like a total creep. I know exactly what you're talking um, about. Yeah. Wait, well, yeah. What, uh, yeah. Anthony Hopkins. I don't know, but it was a whole right? lot of. Yeah. It, yeah, and it was a whole lot of like what he did to poor Tippy Hedren. God. Um, Anyway, point is, I think I think I think Rear Window is kind of example one A as to like the the kind of energy he was tapping into with like the voyeurism and, and all of that. But but we'll we'll get to we'll get to that here in a second. But like just to finish off the pedigree of this stuff, um, I I certainly have other Hitchcock movies on my list. Um, Higher than this, I I don't think I, I'd have to go back and look, but I don't think that there are any higher than than Rear Window. Great, uh, oh, Psycho great. might be, but me, but on, also like this is train. this is okay. the thing. This is the struggle the with, with making these lists. Like, yeah. I think I might have I might have put Psycho higher just because of some like this movie is more iconic for some reason, like some nonsense like film reason, not not actually based on my feelings reason for Psycho to be above Rear Window because I don't believe that I like Psycho more than Rear Window. You want to hear my reason so why I, I like why, it's up there. why I like Psycho? Yeah, go it's on. It's real stupid. It's scary as heck. That is why I like Psycho mm -hmm. so much. And I, I put horror into kind of like two categories, like two very broad categories in my mind, which is like lingering horror, which is like horror that like when you're lying in bed at night, looking at the dark, you can like still see it. And horror that is scary in the moment, but doesn't really stick with you. For me, Psycho is lingering horror. Like I, I think about Psycho. Mm. You can't not take a shower for a week after you watch Psycho well, I and mean, not yeah. think about it. Yeah. I, I think about it like at least right. once a week in the shower, <laughs> like, but that's <laughs> not to, not to like, and the thing is when I was rewatching Rear Window, I was scared in the moment. Like I, it, it is that kind of moment, it, that kind of movie where you are yelling at the screen, where you are yelling, Lisa, get out of there. But yeah. not so much that it lingers with me. That, that's my distinction. Yeah. I, well, and I think too, there's a distinction between, cause I don't, I don't really consider this a, a scary movie at all. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, but it's like, it's. Yeah. The tension, the tension that it creates is, is all, it's like 100% a technique thing, I think, which is fascinating. Uh, and we'll get to more, we'll get to that more in, in the brilliant moments. But, um, the, so this movie in, in 54, it was, it was nominated for best director, uh, best adapted screenplay. The, um, cause we all know Hitchcock never won an Academy Award. So what Hitchcock never won an, I I wrote down all of them except for best director. I'll, I'll have to look that up again. Quick, on, but on. the adapted screenplay lost to a movie called The Country Girl. Yeah. Uh, it was nominated for best color cinematography. Uh, how many um, uh, how, how many of us have which, The Country Girl on our lists? I've never even no. seen that. Okay. Um, well, we all know but, the Academy uh, always gets it right every time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it was nominated for Best Color Cinematography because those were the days where there were two categories, you know, was black and white that. and color. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Burks, who was the DP, is he's an interesting guy. He had a, a background in special effects photography, like or the early special effects photography is kind of where he started. But he and Hitchcock worked together on like a dozen movies or something like that. Uh, he did end up winning the following year for To Catch a Thief. So that's that's incredible. Um, best Sound r Recording. Is another one that it was nominated for, and I, which is one I think that was one of the truly brilliant bits of this movie, is the sound design in general. Um, but it lost uh, this one, Lauren L. Ryder, 
who was nominated, lost to another Jimmy Stewart movie, actually, The Glenn Miller Story. So recording all that big band biopic okay. stuff. Can I say a couple of things here? A couple of things. Go for okay. it. Okay. So oddly, it, A, kind of fr- frankly, and I'm going to talk at length about this later, that the production design is like the unsung hero of this movie. Yep. Right? Uh <laughs> Best actress in a supporting or, or best actress in a leading role this in, in in this Academy Awards was won by Grace Kelly, but not for this movie. That's a fun for fact. Sabrina, right? No, from The Country Girl. The Country Girl. Oh, so oh. she won best. Because I do know, like, one, Edith Head, who did the the, the costumes in this movie, um, you know, she won a, a ten or whatever, eight or ten Academy Awards. Um, but she won this year for a different movie also for Sabrina. Well, I wanted to talk about Edith Head because her costumes in this are gorgeous. And I'm kind of surprised she wasn't nominated. But also, I, I believe she is the winningest woman at the Academy Awards. So she's not. She's wasn't She her. won all of them for. Yeah. She's won a lot. I, th- I think there's something like only yeah. John Williams. Like, I don't want to say if it's wrong, but like only John Williams is nominated for more. Something crazy. Something like okay. that. She's got to be up there. So a couple of things. This movie wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. No. And it lost director to Elia Kazan for On the Waterfront. Which, on the Waterfront, yeah. Which, you know, unambiguous classic. But I don't know if On the Waterfront holds as much of a place in my art as Rear Window does. Certainly doesn't mind. That was that was one that I watched. Um, you know, I watched it my, my requisite one time, and I've not revisited it. Um, so, like, I, I honestly don't know. Could have been a contender. Um, so anyway, four Academy Award nominations. Um, and then uh, it was 42nd the first time that AFI did their top 100, 48 the second time. Um, so it got bumped six spots for some reason in the intervening 10 years. Uh, it is in the National Film Registry, but it does not have a Criterion Spine number. That's because it's too of good of a Hitchcock. movie. It's too good. Right? Yeah, Par- Paramount, Universal, to, whoever's to distributing it. it right now, they don't. Yeah, they don't want to give that to a handful of all those those early Hitchcock guys yeah. uh, that I, we were talking about <laughs> earlier. They get spine numbers yeah. for the Thirty Nine Steps and, yeah. and all. Rebecca that, but, is getting a spine um, number. Yeah, <laughs> Rebecca's got a spine number for sure. But look, I, I mean, there, there's a couple of things about this movie that, you know, th- thematically, like we said up top, it, it does some things about the community, about neighborhood and neighbors in general and how they don't know each other at all. And you can, you know, you're stacked right on top of each other, but nobody ever actually talks to each other except for a couple of moments in this movie. Um, and then... Uh, you know, so there's some interesting stuff going on there, but like for mostly, for the most part, like this movie for me is so cool just because it's all technique. It's all worth studying tech film school technique stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, which makes this movie so fascinating to me. Like I, we were talking about Robert Burks and this is, this is more of a general thing. Like the fact that they, they built this entire set on, uh, in one, in one stage on parent in the Paramount lot. Um, and the way that they had to light it, they pre lit it for both day and night. He spent like 10 days, um, pre lighting it for both day and night so that it would take like 45 some on minutes to switch back and forth between day and night instead of having to relight the whole thing and have like a 200 day shooting schedule or something like that. Um, yeah, they shot this in like but a also month like, and a half, right? Yeah. And they, they lit all of the apartments individually. So like all of the apartments were their own lit sets, but also they had to light it specifically back to front so that when somebody walked closer to the window, it still appeared like they were being lit from within their apartment instead of the light coming in from the courtyard. And so they had to like dim the lights as they moved from back to front so that they wouldn't get blown out when they were walking up to the window. They had to like the way that they did the reflections in the binoculars uh, whenever he's like holding the binoculars up and you can see the the things on the other side of the, the courtyard. Like they did that with like basically a, 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 a transparent matte painting of the thing that they backlit 
and they put it like right in front of Jimmy Stewart. So that's what you're seeing when he when he holds up the glasses. And it, I mean, it's all of these tiny little things that made the job so freaking hard. Um, and we've talked about this. Uh, Cal, I think it's one of the things that you say a lot about the invisible hand of cinema um, and the amount of work that went into this movie to make it appear seamless and to make it appear natural is bananas. Yeah, it's those like little flourishes too that like yeah. you only get once you realize how difficult this is, right? Because to your point, yeah. getting the reflections of people in the binoculars so you see what they're seeing in the same shot, like that is that's hard, hard. to do. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and on on yeah. film yeah. in the fifties. Yeah. I mean, I would just argue like, they're lamp I mean, the bulbs, other, you know, like. No, that's exactly what. They well, are. it's yeah. it's. It, it is in a way, but also it's not because like that's everything was hard. Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, like that's also Hitchcock. too. If you didn't get it in camera, you didn't get it, you know. And and yeah, Hitchcock was very specific about literally everything, which is, you know, the way that they the way that they built the set and the way that they shot the thing and the way um, that like uh, they even had to install a like irrigation system. Yeah. yeah for the rain for the sequence, rain scene, like so that oh. they didn't flood the, it's, it's insane. The stuff that they did. But you know what? It all makes sense too. Right. And it's like Hitchcock is probably like one of the last few actor or directors at that time in like the fifties that also like came up in the silent era. Like to your point, Clint, we're talking about spine numbers of like Hitchcock and stuff like that. He directed silent films and that <laughs> gives a, a certain amount of, um, emphasis on the visuals that I don't think that people that came up in the talkies truly have because like everything needs to be conveyed visually. And there is like old silent films that he used to shoot when he wanted to show like commotion happening above. So he put on a glass, like he shot underneath a glass floor and had people shuffling above it. So you can get like the visual representation of like commotion and it's like those attentions to de those attention to detail that just elevate his movies for literally the rest of his career and taking the time to design these kind of shots where you get the reflections in the lens so you see two things at once in the same frame kind of thing is that exact kind of you know uh nuance and appreciation of details and storytelling in a singular frame because yeah, he's going to cut away to it too, but there's certain power that's like in the still. Yeah. You know, like we look at these pictures of like rear window and it's like almost like any, any still from that, any frame from that movie is like a friggin' poster. Cause you'll just see him sitting there like looking through like the telephoto lens of his camera and you'll see the like, uh, like Lars on the other side in the reflection of the lens and you get the whole, you get the whole story without having to need two shots. Like it's just so efficient. His storytelling is just. And so that's why it works though, because the whole thing about rear window is POV. Yeah. Like it is so important that you feel in, in Jeffrey's POV. And it is because you can see both at the same time. Like I don't, I actually, we, I called it a lamp bump, but I don't know if it would work as well without the reflections, like without all that effort. No, I think it would. I just, it would, like it, it would, just, but like it really adds to it. Yeah, it really yeah. does. Yeah. It's a real flex yeah. that I think people come to in the second or third viewing. Yeah, and it's it's like you were saying, Clint, you watch it and you think it's the simplest movie in the world. Like it's basically a bottle episode of a movie. It's one setting, um, but it was yeah. so complicated. What is it you're looking for? I just want to find out what's the matter with a salesman wife, that's all. Does that make me sound like a madman? What makes you think there's something the matter with A lot her? of things. She's an invalid. She demands constant care. Yet neither the husband or anybody else been in to see her all day. Why? Let's just get into the brilliant moments here. Because I think, um, I think we can start with the, the, first, the first big shot. It's not the first shot of the movie, but the first big one-er. Um, where you kind of establish the pan from the there's cast. A, there's a the wider camera. there's a wider pan of the entire uh, courtyard, but then there's a closer pan, a tighter pan where you start to see the stories of everybody in the thing, and it's it's such a fascinating shot because, and and that's the story of this movie to me is like it's such an ex exercise in perspective, like you're saying, like if and it's funny too because in a way that makes things simpler. Right. Like once you decide to follow the rule of everything is going to be from LB's perspective, from Jeff's perspective. So then you, like that makes things that simplifies things to a certain degree because you're like, well, the camera's got to be here. 
and I have to see the wedding ring across the courtyard. So how are we going to do that? And so like the problem solving aspect of it becomes sort of a narrower focus. But then it becomes it was I think one of the coolest parts about this movie is it becomes a, a question about like, when do you break that rule? You know, like we're tied so firmly to we're in LB's perspective. And like there's one there's just one bit. Yeah. One moment mm -hmm. where it pops out of his perspective. And it's it's later. It's late 80 minutes into the movie, something like that. We finally pop out of the when it's when the dog, the dog dies, owner. Right is like yelling at the entire, at everybody. And then all of a sudden you get close-ups and you get low angle looking up at Miss uh, Torso and you get close-ups of, of Miss Lonely Hearts downstairs from different angles that are all of a sudden, we hadn't seen in 80 minutes worth of movie. But it all stems from this first shot, I think, because the first, like the things that are established in this first shot, there, there's nuts and bolts stuff. There's like heat, it's hot. <laughs> you know, also, we see literally it starts on a thermometer. Uh, and then it pans, there's people sleeping on the fire escape and he's sweating and like all, all of these things that just say it's hot. Like there's nuts and bolts of, of things that get established and different character traits and everything like that. But also it establishes where the soundtrack is going to come from. Like we see the musician change the radio station and that's the song that then, that then plays. It also establishes the sort of pervy voyeurism that, that Hitchcock was, was trapping us with. You know, because like as soon as we see Miss Torso's make, bra fall I, I, off and like and make having to pick it back up, you, is that how you make and, yeah, coffee exactly. in the morning, Clint? You know, just stretching with my with my yeah. toes. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. certainly how I Mostly navigate naked. my apartment. <laughs> That's how I yeah. make coffee. Yeah. I, I need to put on a but show. But like yeah. right off the bat, like any amount of you know. Um, any amount of judgment that we were going to reserve for the way that he's treating his neighbors and for the spying and for the voyeurism, like we're now, we're now complicit, like right out of the gate, you know, which is, it's, it's a fascinating way to start the movie. I want to point out too, cause I think it's in within this scene, it's the only scene where we kind of turn into a voyeur on Jeffrey's because we also pan throughout his apartment and it's a really smart move of one introducing us to who he is. We see a little bit of Lisa immediately. Um, but it, it's kind of him getting a taste of his own medicine and it happens again later in the movie, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but no, this scene I feel like is one of the reasons that this movie holds up really well because not to sound like too vapid, but when I was watching it, I was thinking about like scrolling an Instagram feed. Like we all still do this and <laughs> like, like this, like we still yeah. do this. We're still all looking into other people's lives just in different ways. We're looking at what we, they choose to see us rather than, us being pervy and looking at their most vulnerable moments. But no, it's, it's like, it totally sets the stage. Yeah. Also, it does a great job. It's an, it's an incredible way to open a movie. Yeah. Also like, it's just so efficient, right? Like after you, after you get the layout of the, um, the courtyard and all the different apartments, right. Then it's on the Jeffries and it's like, it's like him sleeping pans to the cast pans to the broken camera up to the shot of the, like, uh, race car just like crashing into the camera and then over and you just see that you know he's a very accomplished photographer and you got yeah. the entire backstory of jimmy stewart's character in about 45 seconds without a word being said you know what it reminded me of to call back to a previous episode it reminded me of the desk the dusty dead the dusty brother dead desk brother desk from who framed it was totally a dusty dead yeah. brother desk yeah yeah, but no, you're right. Like you immediately get the uh, impression that he, yeah, he messed up. I also tried to look up and see if those photos of like World War II were actually Jimmy Stewart photos from World War II, because like he was a colonel in the Air Force, I think. Like he flew bomber missions. Were they? Was yeah. it, were you? No, they were not. Oh, okay. Or at least I couldn't. That would find have been a fun, I, I, cool tour. Yeah, I, I couldn't find them, but like Jimmy Stewart did was a was a. Uh, I think it was a B-25 Liberator pilot during World War II, which is fucking Jimmy Stewart, man. Yeah. I mean, and we, yeah. yeah, we get him and him and Ted Williams. Yeah. yeah. At least you cannot say the dinner isn't right. Lisa, it's perfect. Yeah, I mean, you get and then, you know. You get introduced to all of their relation. You sh you see the rocky relationship of uh, you know the um, the Thorvalds. You see Miss Torso. You see Miss Lonely Hearts. I mean, you see everybody. And there's even like in the very top corner of the complex, there's like a couple with a small a small kid 
that you see like twice, just barely. Oh like God. they never get focused on, but they're there. They're there. You know, yeah. like yeah. two things that I like watching it this time has really hit me. The first is is like I I guess I kind of vaguely knew it, but. I never really focused on it as much as this time of just how all the apartments are kind of representative of like narratives and anxieties of uh, Jeffrey's decision to or to not marry Grace Kelly. Yep. hundred percent. I know? put that in my notes. Yep. Right? Like, yeah, I, I did too. Like, <laughs> all, was, like all, cause like, I, I don't remember. It's been years since I've watched this movie. I don't remember how long ago it is, but I can tell you every time I've seen this movie, it, it never hit me the way that it hit me this time. Same. Like, I was just like, oh, this whole movie's about marriage. Also, <laughs> and I'm going to say this now, after watching it this time, my entire opinion on Jimmy Jimmy Stewart's character has subsequently changed on this viewing. You, the, you, we were ooh. talking about it earlier. We were, and I yeah, was. And I, and I heard you. I, I was from like, what to what? Well, I mean. I, did you like him once? I don't know if I, I, I don't know if. I don't know if like is strong enough of a word. Like, I guess like I'm just like, like this time around, I'm just like Jimmy Stewart. What the f is your problem? Like, are you are you Jim, are, yeah, Jeff sucks? Yeah, are you Jeff sucks? Are you fucking stupid? <laughs> <It sucks. laughs> like, like, like this time, like I'm watching it when the scene where like Grace Kelly's intro. First off, just like. You know, it just cuts to like the close up of like the most male gaze shot of Grace Kelly that yep. could possibly be envisioned. And just like, like, she looks fucking gorgeous in her gown. Then she like leans in and kisses Jimmy Stewart and then goes to the door. And there's like, like, like the most garçon looking waiter standing at the door with a bucket, like with an ice bucket of wine and a lobster dinner. Ready to yeah. eat yeah. a and lobster it, dinner. A lobster dinner, and she's just like, "I brought dinner," and then the rest of that movie, he's like, and then he's just like, "Well, I don't know if I can marry her. Like, she can't go to a f-ing war zone." I'm like, "Are you f-ing kidding me?" Well, and you, you don't like because he's not even young anymore. Like yeah. that was him in World War II. Well, that's that that's was the funniest. Yeah. That, that was the funniest thing that I that I noted is at one point, uh, it's Stella, right? Is is his yeah. nurse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, at, at one point, she's like, "You're a reasonably healthy young man." And when she said that, I looked at it. He's 46. Yeah. Jimmy Stewart is 46 when he's making this movie. Yeah. And and um, Grace Kelly's 25. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, "You're a reasonably healthy young man," and like, she's a young lady. It's like, no, you, no, no you're not. No, you're, you're an old, you're an old, you're an old ass man. And this like young, attractive, extremely rich woman from the accomplished, up- yeah. thoughtful. Yeah really into him literally no faults no like, no like capable has agency see, yeah. which is strange a strange yeah. thing to say about a woman in a movie in the 50s and, but like mm-hmm. here we are like I, like it, and she's not good enough it, somehow you're disappointed the, the men, moment in yeah. this scene and he's it, looking at the lobster dinner and he's like it's perfect yeah. it's like, <laughs> like what god you're so great like, is, is, is she is like yeah. Grace kelly in this movie like the 1950s version of like the mat like the manic pixie like uh, no, I, I no, I don't think so. I love Grace Kelly's. So, so I love her too. I'm just saying she's no, no, no. without flaw. She no. is utterly perfect here. No, but she's dumb as hell at the end, and I'm sure we'll get to it. But like her climbing into that apartment, I'm like Lisa. No, yeah, but but like she's motivated to do it. No, right? no and like, I love her for it. I love her for it, but like, it's a flaw. She's just getting. But after 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 like Jimmy Stewart's like I can't marry you because I don't think you could go to a fucking war zone with me and then like lo and behold somebody gets murdered across the across the way and she's like well do I need to prove to him that I'm adventuring? I don't think so I think he, the whole entire dynamic is him not seeing her so I don't know if I'm reading too much into it but he calls her Lisa I think throughout the movie I'm pretty sure when she's saying her own name right in the scene that we're talking about she says her name is Lisa he's not even saying her name right I don't think he's correct reading her and that she wouldn't go trekking into crazy adventures oh. i th- i think he just doesn't see i think he's such a horrible boyfriend that he just doesn't see that she would do well, wacky that's, crap no i i totally that's, agree that's with exactly you. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly where i can fault uh lisa a little bit because i'm i found it like th- at the end of that first they eat dinner we fade to black they come out there talking about it again some more which by the way 30 minutes into a murder mystery and it's not a murder mystery yet yeah. Like That's a it's good point. just a it's it's this it's this little costume drama about about uh, an old guy who won't marry uh, the perfect woman. Um, 
But when she leaves and she's like, oh, I guess you won't see me until tomorrow night because I love you. And, I, and I'm like, why? Like, that's where I started to get a little mad at Grace Kelly. Oh, I, 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 was I like, wrote, no, I wrote in my notes, out. I started the movie by yelling, Lisa, get out of there. And ended the movie by yelling, Lisa, get out of there. Like the entire yeah, time. Right, for a completely different <laughs> yeah, reason, yeah, right? Yeah, for different reasons. Yeah. Um, but like, no, it, it's... She's a little naive, and I think that's like I, I think she's twenty five. She's half his age. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's she's yeah. a, basically a child compared yeah. to him. Uh, no, I and she is really smart though, uh, and I do love that you get that intro to her after you have the Stella scene. Which can we quickly talk about Stella because she's borderline. I, I did want to I did want to touch on her before we moved along I, because the first interaction that she has with Jimmy Stewart, where it's basically like a, it reminded me of of uh, you know. Uh, uh, a zoomer or a millennial or some like the point is like Jimmy Stewart was the younger generation and she was a generation above telling him that he's stupid. Like, and it, it just, he, she dressed him down in such an effective way that he didn't get. And he's like rolling her eyes like, Oh, she's so it, it had that energy of like an older generation telling the next generation how dumb they are. Uh, that is universally true throughout history. Like everybody thinks the next generation is, is the worst, but then like, the just the dynamic of on screen Jimmy Stewart, who I know is in his is in his forties and he's a grown ass man being so childish. Like I wondered if that's not if we're not supposed to dislike him I, or if we're not I, like, I, we're not supposed I, to take I, I think dislike is a little much. I mean I I I I'm I think he's an idiot. In in this viewing, however, to your point, Clint, um, when I kept on thinking about the way that Stella just like would yell at Jimmy Stewart, all I kept on thinking about is how like uh, Carla and Cheers would yell at Diane Chambers, and I feel that that is mm-hmm. like the exact same vibe. Yeah, because like she has yeah. like that she has that like folksy wisdom of like like she's not an intellectual. Like Stella's not an intellectual, but she's lived a full life and has meaningful experiences that she can articulate and like you know, like have that like grandma aunt level advice that like never left home, yeah. but like understands pain and understands like, like a life lived alone. Worldly yeah. or whatever. Yeah. The world, I mean, it's, it's yeah. the difference between, not saying that she's not intelligent, but it's like the difference between intelligence and wisdom. She has yeah. so much wisdom. wisdom. Yes. Yeah. yes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And the amount of wisdom bombs that she drops in like a five minutes, like scene, I wish I wrote them all down, but there were so many lines. I think she had one talking about her marriage and she was saying something like when Miles and I met, we were just like misfit kids and we're still misfit kids or something like we're that. We're still misfits. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're still misfits. And then uh, she said another line that stuck with me that was like uh a smart woman belongs wherever she is or something like that i was like oh my god stop like speak on it stella yeah. i want stella and ev- like interconnected universes are probably ruining movies but i still want stella to be in every hitchcock movie just randomly dropping right. <laughs> but i think like the detective munch of hitchcock movies. yeah exactly but like i, and I yeah. think the reason why i think she's so necessary here is going back to the jimmy stort character i don't think we're supposed to like him a lot and i think the reason why it works and why my dislike of him doesn't detract from my like of the movie is because he is immediately dressed down he's immediately told like you're being an idiot you are with grace kelly my guy and it's it's grace kelly is throwing herself throwing her bringing you a lobster Lobster dinner dinner. yeah my man (laughs) like and just willing to hang out all night and like gently peck kisses all over his face (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like one of your intros to the movie though is not letting him get away with it which i think is so important and i love these yeah. two female characters no, so much it, well it, and that's that's the good thing about it too is like because there's a there's a, a certain amount of like watching a movie from 1954 in 2023 that's gonna be different you know it's gonna it's gonna land differently now than it did when they made it but like i do think the one thing that holds up is that it's a movie about you know everybody is just moderately flawed and regular mm-hmm. you know like even Jimmy Stewart, nobody's nobody's except for Jimmy Stewart. I mean, he's the worst. It's like we're saying, even though I do yeah. think Jeff sucks pretty bad. Dress, oh, Jeff sucks. He's, Jeff sucks. Ugh. I, 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 I don't want to linger too much, but that their, uh-huh. their argument, their, their first scene together. It made me so where he mad. tells her to shut up. Shut, yeah. Yells at her. And she's just like, I'll yeah. get you jobs being a fashion photographer, which she makes sounds like the easiest 
fucking money possible like you just well, to be fair she doesn't yeah. I and mean, i was trying to think if she doesn't get it or if she's just like kind of in denial because i think i mean one of the flaws of the grace kelly character as perfect as she is is that she is a little naive at times um so i don't think she so, fully gets it so do you think she couldn't actually get jimmy stewart jobs because even jimmy stewart no no i think she could i think she could i know th- well jimmy stewart like, said i'm yeah, afraid yeah, that you, you can, can yeah right yeah, yeah. He was scared of the golden handcuffs, yeah. I think. Yeah, so. that's what I think of what, because he kind of like, I think she said something about getting him like portraits and he like scoffed. He's like, oh, portraits, I'm above that. Uh, yeah. But like she. I want to eat animals that I would think are gross before they're dead. How did they even get together? Said, like, <laughs> like, I don't know. Because you know what? I I'm sure know. that if make... not on a fashion shoot, I don't know how yeah. they would have met. Well, they work yeah. in magazines. You know, like a different me, you know, magazines. Like, New York media is a small, is a small, is a small world. I'm sure these magazine I, people they get in the rooms together. They go to yeah. all the same places. And I bet he has, go to 21 for lunch. He has great anecdotes, right? He sounds like a prick talking about like you know like dressing down his like girlfriend and being like, oh yeah, you can't go to a war zone. But on like the flip side of it, it was just like. Yeah, so I was just in this war and I got to take all these cool photos. Like, let me tell you about this like great adventure I had. I'm sure that works really well. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. not wrong. I think that probably worked. Yeah. Um, but like, again, going back to like the subtext that you're talking about, Clint, like nothing. I, there's even like a, a part in this scene where I think she's like talking about like a cracked cigarette case and she's like, I'll get you a new one. Like, mm-hmm. it's her trying to like shine him up. I got that in Shanghai. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's a different like, town now. Yeah. Yeah. But then you learn at the end, because I, I would argue that this is one of Hitchcock's more romantic movies, because it, it ends with them together. It, it has a happy romantic ending. It does. I, I mean, I, the ending, I think, is, is weird because it, it weirded me out a little bit because of how thoroughly everybody had just moved on. Fair. Like it was like uh, nothing happened. They're literally murder. Paint, they're literally painting the walls in the Thorvalds it, house, and then there's a first. Know, what's your name's got a new puppy, and this is New York, Clint. Um, Do you know how expensive that apartment is? They need to get that rented out. Been, they need to get that. <laughs> I don't know if the rent yeah. was as bad in the. They need to get somebody's that gonna move. They got to get that rented out before quick. they get the yeah. blood off the yeah. walls. But listen, I, I I do think it's telling that we've now spent twenty minutes, more or less, talking about the romance uh, plot line of a movie that is, you know obviously more well known as being a like a thriller like a murder mystery like the fact that we're 30 minutes into the movie and we're 30 minutes into this episode and we haven't talked about the murder or the killer or or any of that yet like there's there's interesting stuff going on in this movie the subtext of this movie is worth exploring uh in ways that hadn't occurred to me prior to 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 revisiting it this week yeah just to talk about it like like let's talk about a couple of these characters like a little bit you know right so there's the newlyweds who just you know you know, they're just putting in the work of their <laughs> putting the, the, in the, the hilarious. Work. Yeah, they're just they're just they're, they're just put the, the, the hilarious like the eye rolly energy yeah. that so, oh, James yeah. Stewart has about like he'll glance over, he'll yeah. see the shades still drawn, and it's one of those like then, then <laughs> these guys then, they're doing then, it again. Then there's like the childless couple who like you know sleep on the fire escape to be cool at night and then yeah. when it rains and like they have their little tug of war. It, like that's so good. They might be empty nesters. No, do you think they're empty nesters? Also, maybe kudos to them and their dumb waiter for the dog. That is yeah. as a man who once lived on a six story walk up. Anything you could do to avoid walking up and down those stairs. Listen, I was like, should I train my dog well to do played. that? Like, I don't think I don't trust her in a basket like that. But, you know, it was smart. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's smart. And then like and then you get to the more depressing side of the things where, like, frankly, Jimmy Stewart being an asshole is going to lead, which is like the Miss Lonely Heart aspect of it all lonely hearts yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then you know and then there's the the family with the small child that's just kind of on the periphery like it's there it's not a present concern of his so we don't really spend any time on it but like there's there's a couple of scenes that open with like you know the guy on the on the fire escape helping his his kid into get dressed you know like putting a shirt on it or whatever and like so there's every every stage of some type of married life, some type of potential future is is like there in the court. But there's also the reflections of the present as well, right? So like Mrs. Torso is very clear, like Miss Torso is very clearly a reflection of Grace Kelly. And she has that great line. Miss, of, by the way, Miss Torso. Great name. The, the great. most objectifying great name, name yeah. you could come up with. Great, fun, yep. great <laughs> fucking name. Yep, which for a guy that only knows what he sees yeah. through his telephoto mm-hmm. lens while he's watching her get dressed, mm-hmm. like... 
but like makes sense the grace kelly line of like she's doing the most dangerous job of all like which is like navigating the wolves kind of yeah that, Cal, I it's, had that, to it's pause that night the where movie. there are there are yeah. three men in the yeah i had to pause. that night where there are three men in her apartment and yeah. and she, jimmy stewart's kind of like oh yeah she's a popular gal yeah. and and she's just the, like the fact that i wrote down that the grace line. kelly could be like no 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 I'd I'd say she's doing a woman's hardest yeah, job, jug- juggling wolves. I was juggling wolves, rocked. Yeah. And there's there's sometimes where I'm watching a movie where I know it's like written by a man, but a woman will say something from a woman's perspective that is so like profound that I'm like, who told him? Yeah. Like who told out Al- like juggling wolves? How does he know? <laughs> Which one of us told Alfred? Like yeah, like that was that was probably his mistress yeah. That, yeah. that gave him that line. Juggling, but... I gotta get that tattooed or something. And then That's such a juggling bar. wolves. Yeah, no, yeah. that was an incredible yeah. line. And then the last person is the musician, who I think is a reflection of Jimmy Stewart, right? Which is the isolated artist that's like struggling mm-hmm. to do his thing, and he's like lonely as well. Yeah, and I think like we have these like eight apartments that well, are all know, just like is pre- there it's like it's like almost like dickensian like present like ghosts of presence pasts and futures just all i mean you could argue at once you could argue that's that the thorvalds are representative of that yeah too. absolutely oh, yeah. Like, if absolutely there's some if there's some uh something in jeff's uh, psyche that's worried about like if i go down this path with this perfect woman at some point is she going to be that nagging wife and i'm going to want to kill her Mm-hmm. And like, is that a reason for his obsession and wanting to solve this murder and wanting to say like, no, I'm separate from him. Like you can, I mean, there's, you can tug on all of those threads and they all make sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's just a, a lot happening. But Clint, to your point about the fact that we've talked more about this scene than the actual murder, that's the thing that kind of struck me on a rewatch because I, I had remembered it being kind of a murder mystery. I didn't remember it being this much of a romance and being about this this couple and i think that's arguably the most interesting part about it like i still do enjoy how the movie kind of lets you try to solve the murder yourself in a way by again putting you in jeff's shoes but like that was and the funny thing is about it it's based on a short story where the grace kelly character wasn't there like there was no love interest character whereas i don't know if this movie would work for me if grace kelly was or you know lisa wasn't there like it's it's fascinating to me say she's doing a woman's hardest job juggling wolves it's it's 32 minutes i I, because i made a note 32 minutes into the movie is when you get the scream and the glass shatter yeah and then and then he looks up and he's like that's the 32 minutes in is the first time we get any hint that this is going to be a thriller of some kind I mean, even the um, very opening, which is crazy. yeah, like if you didn't see directed by Alfred Hitchcock, you wouldn't know this is a thriller. Yeah. No, not it's at like all. A, a, well, the fact that, that all of the, that the soundtrack is all diegetic, that, you know, that everything, it's just this sort of presentation of what's happening in this apartment complex. Um, and it's, it's downright cheery for a lot of it. <laughs> you it's know, there's jazzy. A of, like the opening scene is yeah. like jazzy as heck. I was, I totally forgot about that. I, no, it's, it's, yeah, it suddenly becomes a murder mystery, but yeah. And, and I think someone said it earlier, like, it's probably not a horror movie per se. It's more of a thriller. I would say it's more of a thriller. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, I don't think it's a particularly, even a scary movie. I don't think it's designed to be. I, I mean, I think, I, I think Hitchcock was, you know, it's, you read so many things about Hitchcock and, and how he was, I mean, Hitchcock might've been a, a really talented troll, you know, like he just kind of wanted to screw with us. Like, I, I think there's part of his filmmaking that that evokes that. Like and and like we were talking about in the, the opening shot and like like here you are. Like, by the way, you sat down in this theater and now you're a voyeur. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> that's that's kind of the the energy of the opening of this movie. And you don't even know that it's happening because it's another 30 minutes before you realize that you're part of something more sinister, I guess. You know, mm-hmm. no, it's it's. Um, yeah, I, I, we've been talking about the. I just think that opening and the ending is so impressive that I don't mind lingering it, on it a bit. And also, b- right. while we're still on it, that that dress that Grace Kelly is wearing, Edith Head, you should have gotten a, another Oscar incredible. for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the the fact that that Grace Kelly's character, that Lisa wasn't in the source material, like you you kind of wonder because Hitchcock had worked with Edith Head plenty at this point. Edith Head was was who she was uh, at the time, so you wonder if she's like, I'm gonna put Grace Kelly in here, and she works in the fashion industry. There's your excuse. Go yeah. make some great yeah. great stuff. It's like reverse engineering. He could have uh, done that. Uh, like he, had, there's no reason he couldn't have. Yeah, yeah. 
just flex. I'm going to um, give you an excuse to what, flex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any other specific scenes we want to talk about? What do you guys got? It's another one with the two of them. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, it's it's a little while later. I want to say it's like, it's after the scream. And it's when he's like fully obsessed. I love the scene where she gets on board with it. You know what I mean? You have that one shot. And I think I wrote down, I don't have. She looks across and she sees the and trunk. And she's arguing with him. And she Yeah, yeah. She thinks yeah. he's crazy. And then you, and he says something. Of course he says something horrible and you think she's reacting to that but no she's reacting to seeing the trunk yeah and and what is it she she says something like start from the start beginning. from the beginning what do you know yeah. <laughs> like, get me <laughs> get me caught up and i'm gonna take you seriously this time yeah. yeah but like that that's to me why this lisa character has so much agency she doesn't believe anything this this shitty man says until she sees it for herself and the moment she sees she's it for yeah. herself she's like oh <laughs> let's talk like i i think that's so good and like the light on yeah. grace kelly's face too and her like look of astonishment is is really struck me on this watch and then to get to the point later where it's it's her and stella that are that are driving the ship at that point like they're the ones that are like oh i'm gonna go dig up that flower bed and no i'm just gonna sneak into his apartment and then they're just off you know like yeah and to um, to go back to the scene of of stella's introduction one thing that i really like about that scene is it kind of reverses the roles uh because for most of the movie jeff is trying to convince everyone that there's been a murder and nobody except for like lisa at at, at, at this point believes him and stella i think stella's St kind of uh I think she's 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 intrigued. She's intrigued. Yeah, Stella. She, yeah, I think she at at minimum is enjoying the the exercise. Yeah, yeah she's you know? like she's playing <laughs> with him a bit. Um, but like yeah. in that opening scene with Stella, she's telling him about how she like should have been like a gypsy fortune teller because she predicted like the market crash because she was taking care of like the CEO of General Motors and he was really stressed and like yeah. Jeff kind of like kind of doubts her a little bit. And then the roles are reversed. And it's kind of what you were saying, Clint, again, about the subtext. Like, everything is so intentional. When General Motors has to go to the bathroom 10 times a day, the whole country's ready to let go. Can we talk? There's one. It's another thing that, that speaks to, I think, what everything that Hitchcock was doing in this movie. But there's a scene. Uh, and it's one of the most memorable scenes for me. One of the scenes that sticks out about this movie for, for some reason is the scene where they're all standing there swirling their brandy. <laughs> like, is that is that funny to you guys too? Because for some, it, to me, it is hilarious. Um, like they're standing there having a conversation about, there's a three shot, a lingering three shot of all three of them standing there and they're having a conversation, but they're also just swirling their brandy, <laughs> which is so absurd how? and such a weird bit of business to give all three of them in such a noticeable way that my entire life, ever, ever since I saw this movie for the first time, I was like, that's funny. <laughs> so two things. I totally agree with you and it's amazing. A, why did brandy fall out of flavor, like favor? Why don't I think brand people street know. still drink brandy? Yet? You're from the Midwest, which I think yeah, is like enough. the last bastion of brandy. <laughs> brandy <laughs> we're carrying the, we're waving yeah, the brandy flag. drinkers. In a I I had a bottle of it not too long ago, I think. But we used to gamble on risk and drink brandy in college. That was that was you were drinking brandy while you played <laughs> that's risk. A terrible yeah. idea. It's we felt that's what that we felt that's what you know generals did. Oh, fair. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we smoked black and milds while we played Risk, so that we could have the little plastic, like we oh, like, yeah. have the like, oh, Douglas MacArthur kind so of. So you like, went the Douglas MacArthur route. We went the British. Yeah. You know, I feel like Montgomery <laughs> is just sitting around there. You know, swirling. the point is, dudes playing Risk with with business yeah. is is the way to go. Um, but uh, to your we, point about uh, it being funny, I think what's funnier about that scene and the brandy is when Doyle tries to like throw it back and just yeah. fails completely. And he looks like, yeah. so, it, like just like drips out of his mouth a little bit. Like it, he looks like yeah. such an idiot when he does that. And he's being such a jerk. It almost looks like he did it accidentally because he like stumbles through his line after that. And like it felt. Oh, you mean like the actor? Yeah. Then there. Yeah. It, it felt like it was a flub that they left. But that it just worked so wonderfully. But the other thing that I flagged about this scene is there's a moment, and this is this is a whole thing about Hitchcock and blocking, which if we talk about more Hitchcock movies on this show, like the way that he blocked and the way that he, we've talked about like power dynamics on screen in blocking. I think we did it, we talked about it in Sunset Boulevard, but like Hitchcock was so good at it. Yeah. Um, there's part of this sequence is there's, they're sitting there, twirling their brandy, swirling their brandies. And the detective is 
heavy in the foreground. Like it's a close up of him in the foreground and Lisa is just staring daggers at him from the background. Cause he's like, can't we just have a drink and like forget the whole thing? And she's like, Fuck you No, we can't with her look, but she's back there with her brandy. And then like, but she's the, the angle is like, even though he's big in the frame and he's weightier in the frame, like she's on top of him. Like she's upper corner staring down at him. She's got energy on top of him. And then she moves over and the camera follows her and she's the same size in frame as, as Jeff. And it's just things like that, that like puts her at odds with the detective and then her on the same team with Jeff all in one sort of fluid shot all while they're swirling brandy. And I, I, I love it. It's just like the way that they stage power dynamics and Hitchcock is, was so good at it in everything that he ever did. Like that's, and to your point about the silent film thing from earlier, Cal, like that's, yeah, there are so many moments in this movie that are, that need that type of, that type of education, right. That need that type of like, I only have visuals to explain what's going on in the scene and to do it efficiently. Um, you know, I got to put her sort of in a stronger position and then she's going to move over here to join her ally. And then like the camera's going to adjust to capture that correctly. And there's so many other scenes in this movie where people are watching other people realize things, which is an interesting little silent film trick, I think too. But anyway, you- the, the, on top of the swirling, the brandy being funny, there's really like interesting power dynamics through blocking happening in that, in that sequence. To your point, trying to be very conscious about the subconscious, right? Of like, cause like all those things are like, you know, you ask anybody, you ask nine people about why they think this scene works. How many of them are going to talk to you and be like, well, the way that they did the blocking and stuff, like, like the way that they did the blocking and the framing, it, it manipulates the power. Like, most talk people, about the tension, I yeah, feel. Most people don't think about it that way. And that's really what elevates like these truly profoundly good filmmakers is they think about the things that no one else does. And that's a perfect example about it, right? Of like, how do you convey power dynamics in a, in not only the blocking, but in a dynamic camera movement? So it's not just like static and co- and cross cutting and stuff like that. I think they do that a lot with the Grace Kelly character too, because and again, I I actually feel like the wheelchair that Jefferson is uh, he uses it as a real gift, Hitchcock, because you have that scene that I was talking about where she's kind of just trying to talk away the murder aspect uh, of what's happening. And she's like hunched over him, like trying to talk down at him, but he still doesn't seem so small somehow. And then in the line that I was so rocked by the juggling wolves one, she has a really powerful stance when she says that she's like standing above the wheelchair, hand on hip, just being sure as hell. No, I think he, he really takes advantage of one, the wheelchair and two, just Grace Kelly being cool. Well, even, and also like she's up, behind him over his shoulder and kind of the Jiminy Cricket spot, you know? Yeah. Like, no, you're, you're wrong about that. I like and that. Like, kind of like the angel on the, his shoulder the other, or something. Yeah. Yeah. And the other line of hers that I really liked was it was the moment where, um, it was, well, it was the same scene where she was, where he, she was talking about like, well, she doesn't love any of them. And he says, how do you know? He's like, you said it reminded me of my place. Mm. And like, that's uh, her being able to say like, to say, I love you, you, you idiot, in a clever way that it was, anyway, that was a really good scene. And, and he doesn't watching. get it. <laughs> and he still doesn't get it because Jeff sucks. Jeff sucks. There's one <laughs> takeaway from our, our, our hour and change conversation about Rear Window. Jeff sucks. <laughs> this guy sucks. Um, that, is that, is, is that it, our is headline? Any, Jeff sucks, else? but Rear Window is awesome. <laughs> Jeff sucks. And, and I don't hate but that's not wait, yeah. I don't want to linger too much, but it doesn't bother me that that much that Jeff sucks. Like like and I just never thought of No, it's totally fine. Yeah, no, like yeah. it's, it's to- there's nothing wrong with flawed characters, yeah. you know? Like that's totally fine. I was just what the reason I think that we're talking about it so much is I was surprised at how much I thought he sucked. Yeah. Yeah. His suckiness is never like, I didn't I didn't remember that at yeah, all. His suckiness is never really rung rung true to me until like this viewing where I'm just sitting there just like yeah. Damn it, dude. <laughs> Get it together. What the fuck is the matter with you? Just like, where was someone to just like slap him? Like, Stella should have just like fucking Stella verbally him, did it. I would slap them in the face. Yeah. And just said, that's she enough. She was not shy. Yeah. And yeah. That is enough, enough of your shit. But then at that point, like, would we even have a movie? 
But I still, I still do think he's a really interesting character, and I'm, I'm gonna get like pretentious about this. The my first viewing of this movie was actually in journalism school. It was one of those journalism movies, and it's not really a journalism movie, but it is about a journalist. Um, and as someone who went to journalism school and is ostensibly a jur- journalist, uh, there are certain reasons why you get into journalism. Like maybe you want to speak truth to power, maybe you like telling stories, but a lot of it is you're just nosy and you want the gossip. And that is his entire character, I feel. And like going back to the subtext, there are so many like scenes where he's trying to scratch that itch in his cast. And I feel like his entire character in this movie is him being out of action for six weeks and trying so bad to to scratch that gossip journalist itch. And it it really vibes with me. That's a really good read. I hadn't thought about that. Nothing's an accident in this. Like nothing is an accident. No, nothing at all. But I I, I, um, I hate Jeff, but I love him as like a messy journalist. Yeah, no, I mean he's a he's a good character, even though mm-hmm. he sucks. Like you, sucky characters can be good. 100%. Also, yeah. <laughs> like let's be clear about that. Let's start from the beginning again, Jeff. Tell me everything you saw and what you think it means. The the other thing that I had on my list that might take us to the end because we kind of have to move move it along here, but the um, the end when <laughs> Thorvald is on his way to the apartment, and I think and this is going going back to the way that Hitchcock established the language of this movie so well with that first shot and like where the sound is coming from and what we're like because this is the other thing this is a noisy movie. Like this is sitting in a city with the window open, noisy, right? Like there, are, there's traffic, there's you know birds, and there's music coming from everywhere, and voices coming from the street, and you can the rain falling and all this stuff. But when, uh, when Thorvald is on his way to come get Jeff there at the end, it is you notice how quiet it gets. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Like it gets very quiet, and then it becomes about it's still the soundtrack is still the stuff that we've been trained for this entire movie, in that it's footsteps, and it's doors slamming, and it's floorboards creaking, and it's just like environmental sounds that now we're hearing, thinking like there's there's danger coming, like the way that we've sort of become fluent in the sound design of this movie by the end, and the way that Hitchcock uses it to like be tense is incredible because like any other Hitchcock movie it would have been like, there would have been like Bernard Herman strings to tell us to start to be scared, but it's the complete opposite way with this movie, which I think is why it's, it's, it's probably my favorite of his movies because it's so, it's such a consistent technique that's used for such specific reasons through the entire runtime of this movie. So the only one thing I thought a lot about this time when watching it was the police, are in uh, Lars's apartment when they realize he's attacking Jimmy Stewart. <coughs> it takes about 45, maybe a minute on camera for them to get Jimmy Stewart. I think that's totally unrealistic for a bunch of cops to run three quarters of a block because no one cuts through the courtyard, right? They run around. They come in the front door of his apartment, and it's just like – like. A, to run around a city block in New York. B, (coughs) get into the building. C, run up all the stairs and then break into the door as this capable burly man is like trying to to shove a casted Jimmy Stewart over a ledge. Doesn't seem, doesn't, the timing doesn't work for me. It doesn't, I'll allow it. That was a thread, that was a thread you wanted to pull on during that sequence? (laughs) I I, I thought about it a lot. All the threads. Okay. (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, you're not wrong, but it I'll allow it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, listen, is it a deal breaker? No. Yeah. It's just like who's like they, like that these cops are just like at the store like at the like at the front door of that apartment building just like hitting all the buzzer buttons just like waiting for something like who's <laughs> like who's somebody let us yeah know. like come on. <laughs> well, the fact that Jimmy Stewart's door wasn't locked. That's uh, fine. For Thorvald to just walk in. That was the thing that bumped me. I was like, you you were sitting there like, just lock the door, man. Well, I that that might have actually, I would, not to blame Stella and Lisa, that might have actually been their fault because they might have been so excited in their little, in their scheme that they might have forgotten to lock the door. Yeah, that might have been them. To, I'd like to imagine they both had keys. So it's not like oh, yeah. they had to leave it unlocked so they could get in and out. Yeah. 
But I, to anyway. keep talking about this scene, though, uh, Clint, you mentioned how like it only breaks the kind of POV ones. This in the only using it once camp, the moment when uh, when Thurswald looks at us, and well, he's looking at Jeff. Yeah. But it's like the moment that you've been waiting for the entire movie, right? You're waiting for him to notice Jeff and be like, hey. But then it comes so late and he looks right at us. And I, yeah. I like, I jumped. I was like, well, oh. Oh, well, okay. well, it's like we, we've gotten so comfortable about spying Yeah. at this point. We've gotten so comfortable with being peeping Toms along with, uh, with Jeff this whole time that like when somebody does finally look at us, it's like, oh. Well, can know? I? Because even when we meet Lisa, she's not looking straight into the camera. Like she's looking just off, off frame a little bit. Like it's nobody has looked us in the eye yet until Thorvald does. It's it's weird. Uh, actually, Thorvald has kind of been doing one thing, which is the. Are we going to talk about the same thing? No, no, I don't think so. Go ahead. I don't think we. Uh, probably one of the, some of the coolest shots in this movie that we haven't talked about yet. And like, you want to talk about like the voyeurism of it all is when like. Uh, Lars, what's his last name? Thorvald? Thorvald, yeah. Thor Thorvald. Thorvald. When he's sitting in the dark smoking. Yeah. There are multiple times when, like, people are out and about and just, like, you know, convening and talking or, like, he just, like, murdered his wife and he's just sitting in a dark room and all you could see is the ember of his, like, cigar or cigarette and it's just, like, that is like the sinister projection of the eyeballs yeah. looking out on the courtyard without actually having them. Well, and, and again, to go back to, to Robert Burks and his, his work, uh, the cinematographer, his work on this, this movie and the way that they had to light all of these apartments individually to be like, and they did that in, I don't know that it was daytime, but it was dusk. Like it wasn't night when his apartment was completely black. Yeah. Right. Like, and so to light that on a long lens, to the where we're only seeing the glow of a cigarette on film in the fifties yeah. is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Like it's another one of those things where like, I just don't understand how the skill involved to, to, to do that. Like I, I am old enough to where I did have to take a cinematography class on, on film. Ooh, so in, mean, so in is film I. School. I, I shot on 16 but too. I, it was awful. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Hated it. The scariest thing I ever done in my life. It was so nerve wracking. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like, they didn't tell me that I had a I had a gaff the uh, had a gaff the magazine shut. So uh oh, I, did you did you blow a whole roll of film? I did, I blew it. I blew it all. There was just light leaks on everything, and then like yeah. I'm, I got all my footage back, and it's just all light leaked. And then my professor's like, "Oh yeah, you have to tape tape the like you have to gaff tape the yeah. the uh, magazine shut." I'm like, "Why didn't you say that?" You got to tell me. Yeah. Yeah. How am I, Why, how, to do I it? how am I supposed to know this? You have to do it in a bag I'm eight, also. I'm 18 years um, old. How the fuck am I supposed to know this? I'm just <laughs> give me my DV tape back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um I, I do want to talk more about it, the end though. Unless you're going to talk something. Yeah. No, go please. Um, no, the only thing, thing I was going to talk about was was just another like camera in terms of how difficult it was with the lenses and and the the inserts like when he's finding the rings and stuff like that getting those inserts in a believable way is part of this this uh, go find the american cinematographer article about rear window and robert burks because it's it's ludicrous how difficult it was to shoot this movie and make it look natural but like they had to they they started with a super long lens from jimmy stewart's perspective and it was just a real long lens, but they couldn't get enough light on it to also have enough depth of field and enough detail for the rings to read. So they had to like, they took the crane that they used for all the other shots and they had to like boom halfway out and put a slightly less long lens so that they could still get enough light on the rings and enough detail with enough depth of field to actually have it expose in focus. Like the way, just, just to shoot an insert of a ring. And make it look like it's somebody looking at it through a telephoto lens. Yeah. Which is just, it's one of those things. It's like this, this whole thing, it looks so simple. And this movie is a simple machine in a lot of ways, but it is so complicated to, to make it look like that. And it allows you from the POV perspective, like I, I think I touched on this earlier, but if you want to pretend to be Jeff and try to solve the mystery with him, it allows you to do that. Like it allows you to kind of get these little bits and put them together and put them on a imaginary like vision board or something. Like it, it allows you to be Sherlock a little bit. And I think that's really smart. Yeah. 
I don't know. I think that's what's it with the let's talk about the ending yeah. again real quick because so, we're, we're, we're going to have to move on here in a second. I do want to touch on one shot going back to what you're saying about blocking Clint. It's when uh, Thurwald walks into his apartment, the unlocked apartment, stupidly, and he looks really tall and imposing in that shot. But then it turns to Jeff in his wheelchair and they give him the exact same treatment. They drench him in the silhouette in the same way they do Thorwald because it's kind of putting the like accusation on Jeff because he's been a gross peeping Tom this entire time. And he did, like, yes, he's been solving a murder. Yeah. But like, I like that it doesn't almost like, yes, Thorwald is obviously the bad guy here. He killed his wife, but like it doesn't, Jeff doesn't look like the hero in this shot. He looks like a skeevy yeah. peeping Tom. In his little chair. Well, and also, like, the way that he reacted, this is another moment where I think I typed in my notes, Jeff sucks, is uh, his reaction to when Thorvald is attacking Lisa. Yeah. And Jeff's reaction is to just go like, oh, and that's it. Like, like he's got, something. there's no, he, yeah, he's do something. Like, and I guess technically he already called the cops, so that's something. But also, like, the way that he reacted to it was just so squirrely. Like he could have yelled like, or like, not, I can see you, man. Like I can see you killing my girlfriend. Yeah. Like he could have done yeah. something. Yeah. He hid. Yeah. He hid when that happened. So there was a, that was another moment where I was like, Jeff sucks. Jeff sucks. And so, yeah, by the end when he's like, he's literally backing his wheelchair into a corner in the shadows and that's his defensive position when Thorvald walks into his apartment, like there's a sense that like, he's kind of getting what he's deserved, what, what's coming to him also. Like, you know, he's he's not getting away scot-free uh, on this. I um, I wrote in my notes, and I don't know if I stand by it, which is why I put a question mark on it. I said, does Jeff deserve this? And I don't know that he does. I don't know if anyone deserves being shoved out a window when you already have a broken leg. But, like, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, whether or not he hit, deserved hit. it, but whether – I certainly don't feel bad that it happened. No, no, no. Yeah, Hitchcock also, like, in interviews at least, like, was just like, yeah – He's kind of a bad guy because, like, That's what I'm this guy's a this, like this guy's a murderer. Like, the like Lars is a murderer, but like, hit, like Jimmy Stewart had no business yeah. like spying on him. Yeah, he was yeah. being a there's, little creepy. There's bad and there's worse. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, obviously the murderer is worse, but. Yeah, if we have to, if we have we, to rank crimes, gun to your head, you have to. Pick voyeurism one. is not as bad as murder. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's the official cinefic stance thank you for watching. yep might as well we'll put put that in uh in quotes and and we'll put uh dan's Listen, name if it wasn't if it wasn't um, for voyeurism marty mcfly would have never have been born well there's a lot that's, that's true <laughs> weird about back to the future i thought you were about to say there's a lot we can thank voyeurism for Lots of people have knives and saws and ropes around their houses. Not and not lots them. of men don't speak to their wives all day. Lots of wives nag and men hate them and trouble starts. But very, very few of them end up in murder, if that's what you're thinking. Uh, it's pretty hard for you to keep away from that word, isn't it? You... Let's do movie lists. Yep. So uh, Rear Window, uh, as you can imagine, has appeared in some way or another on a bunch of different movie lists of ours over the years. Uh, top 10 beginnings of all time um, for the opening. Um, it's actually the thumbnail of, of that video. Um, best scenes of all time. Uh, we included that same shot, the opening shot, as the, our example for uh, how to open a movie. It's a little bit of repeating ourselves there, but, you know, we've made a lot of these. Um, we also did a best opening shots of all time, and I can imagine it got an honorable mention in, in there somewhere. We covered Robert Burks in our top 10 cinematographers of all time. He was our pick for uh, the era of transitioning from black and white to color. Um so we talked about him a lot in there. And then Lisa Fremont got a spot on our 10 best character introductions, okay. uh, which there... we touched on that scene a yeah. little bit in this. But um, but there is, you know, there is something that's also in Jeff's perspective about that shot, too. Right. I mean, obviously, there's the 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 bit where we're literally looking up at her from Jeff's perspective. But even the the quick little like step print kind of stutter uh, bit that it does as she's leaning in for the kiss, it, it, it heightens it in a way that we don't see anywhere else in the movie until like all that fast motion stuff of everybody like running out of their apartments at the end. 
but like that step print of her kind of the stuttery leaning in for that kiss is it's it's a weird little effect that 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 heightens the reality of that particular moment um in a way that i think is following the same rules as the rest of the movie just in in kind of a different direction i mean and it- but that-, that shot in particular, too, and, and Cal, you kind of mentioned how male gazy it, it is. It is because we're watching nearly, not all, but I would say nearly the entire movie through Jeff's perspective. So oh. it makes sense. The entire movie is I, I technically mean, a, a male, a male. Yeah, are we watching it through his perspective because I don't understand how he's still having uh, a hard time coming to the conclusion that he needs to marry Grace Well, <laughs> Well, he's stupid. That's how he sees it. <laughs> He sucks. Yeah. sucks. I thought we, we, Jeff we sucks. That out. He sucks. sucks. That's why. You're right. I forgot. I forgot. We've established this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what other list does it belong on that we didn't that we Thrillers, didn't put it bro. on? I'm, I imagine it's gotten some honorable mentions here and there, but like thrillers. Uh, shittiest protagonist. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> thrillers and shitty- shittiest protagonist. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it probably belongs on a th- on a thriller list though. Uh, yeah. I mean, the movie has been cloned a ton. Yeah. Right, like De Palma did it with Body Double, and we haven't talked about Disturbia yet. Yeah, we haven't talked about Disturbia yet, yeah. and like, and that's the real crime. <laughs> I like Disturbia, but I will. I, do too. I will say this: there's Disturbia came out in 2007, I think it was right, like yeah. right around there. Hold on, let me. It was. I looked it up earlier. Okay, yeah. it was 2007. That was right around the time that like. I learned what Misan Sen was. And, you know, like th- th- that was within two years of me getting my first like film textbook and understanding the jargon. So then you just start to watch movies differently. And that was like the first time when I realized that like how smart Hitchcock was. Cause I remember thinking Disturbia was really, really good, except for this one moment in when Shia LaBeouf and the woman lead i forget her name in it but like they're looking out the window and i think it's david morrissey that's like the bad guy or david, david morris david yeah. morris right like he's right. a bad guy i don't think it was morris no uh, you're right it's, it's david <laughs> it morris morrissey. david morris david morris right shia labeouf and and the grace kelly look away from the window but the camera lingers on the window and then you see a blood splatter across like david morse's window that they were looking through so now you are aware like at that moment the ca- like the audience saw more than shia labeouf did so like you have and that's a- no good you have asymmetrical knowledge and that's yeah. the only moment it does it and it kind of takes you out of it and to your point earlier about how like Hitchcock went so far out of his way to follow the rule. Mm-hmm. Like the difficulty wasn't that like when to break the rule it was like the di- like the discipline is like the lengths you are willing to go to to follow the rule. And I don't think that this filmmaker paid as much respect to that discipline as Alfred Hitchcock yeah. did and his film subsequently faltered because of it. Well, there, and, and I think too, there, there's one, one or two moments in the movie where like we see so we, because we see the woman leave the apartment yeah. with Thorvald. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's sleeping that during that. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, that's it. Um, but even that there's mystery surrounding that. Like, we're not sure what that means or what that is. Certainly not blood splatter on the window. No, know, but no, it definitely wasn't blood splatter on the window. Yeah. Um, any other movie lists that we need to add this to <sighs> best sets? Oh, I think. production design, yeah. Production yeah. design. I mean, Produc- some sort that, of production design, that, set set design. That, we did a production design. That set is incredible. And I think sets mm-hmm. too, actually. That set is incredible. I mean, sound design, maybe. Mm-hmm. Sound design yeah. is really cool. But I like the list it landed um, on. It also makes me feel yeah, a little so validated we, for talking about the opening for so long because really the opening is strong. Yeah, I mean the whole movie is strong. Yeah, it's no, just it's, yeah. it's a tight one ten, one eleven, yeah. whatever it is. One thirteen, I believe. Um, well, those that, that that those two last minutes, I could take or leave. Yeah, we've mm. we've done both. It's top ten movie sets ever built and top ten production designs of all time, and I can't imagine it didn't get an honorable, at least an honorable mention in either or both of those. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it should. Uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to delete those uh, from YouTube if we didn't. Mr. Thorwald could scarcely put his wife's body in a plot of ground about one foot square. 
Unless, of course, he put her in standing on end, and then he wouldn't need a knife and saw. Okay, shall we torf? Let's torf. Yeah. We surprisingly didn't blow any, I think, uh, which is cool. Um, all right, torf. First one, true or false? Hitchcock's approach to directing in Rear Window was considered unconventional for the time. Most notably, he would deliberately misdirect his actors and give feedback with facial expressions. True. That's true. Yeah, I, I buy that. Uh, the story I, I've heard is that Although, he is gave it the, the married couple fighting on, on the balcony with the uh, mattress competing directions, which is why they uh, went back and forth. I'm not at liberty to answer no. yet until Clint gives his answer. No. No, I'm going true. I I totally believe that. True, and extra credit for Cal. Uh, Yeah, actors Sarah Berner and Frank Caddy played the unnamed pair who spent most of the movie fidgeting on a mattress outdoors without incident. For this scene, he told Berner to pull the mattress one way and Caddy to pull the other. Neither knew the other had uh, received conflicting directions. So when Hitchcock called action, the pair struggled with the mattress until Caddy accidentally flew into the window. Hitchcock thought it was so funny, he kept it in the movie, which I think is adorable. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and also uh i bet they were pissed oh i would be pissed i would be so pissed <laughs> and also thelma ritter uh who played stella phenomenal i don't think we've said her name yet uh thelma ritter said that hitchcock wouldn't really communicate with the cast by talking to them she said if he didn't like a scene he looked like he was going to throw up <laughs> which i can wow picture. that's pretty extreme i know i feel like that's worse than words yeah i know all right you got the first one all right torf Uh, Grace Kelly was loved by all on set. In her biography, Kelly states that... True, true. (laughs) In her biography, Kelly states that Jimmy Stewart's wife was constantly on set due to her infatuation with the actress. True or false? True. True, yeah. Well, I guess... Because she's not not as dumb as Jeff is. I'm going to go with the true just because I know, like, Grace Kelly is, by all accounts, an absolute sweetheart. False. She's a princess. Yeah. She was literally yeah. a princess. No, it's false. Uh, Alma. Stewart's wife was not. She was not happy yeah. that. Uh, no. So Alma. She was, yeah. Almost everyone loved Grace Kelly. She was monitoring all of the all of the kissy face scenes. Yeah, she didn't. Uh, basically, she was less than thrilled at the prospect of having her husband work with Kelly. Uh, she had a reputation, whether earned or not, about having affairs with her male co-stars. Uh, so basically, she was on set constantly, just watching the two, and nothing materialized. Listen, this is what this is what Hollywood is. Just attractive people being attracted to each other. Yeah. You know. It's a shame that it's not That's disappointing. It, it, it's not it's not Grace <laughs> Kelly's fault. Like she was loved. Be, no. Yeah, she was still great. Um, all right. Torf, and I'm gonna help you a little bit by saying this first sentence is true. This isn't the Torf part. Okay, this is true. Grace Kelly refused to smoke cigarettes in her films. That's true. All right, Torf. For Rear rear Window, she made her one and only exception. In the movie, she smokes her first ever cigarette on screen. True or false? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember remember her smoking cigarettes. I don't either. Um, Because I I was even weirded out by the fact that she talks about a cigarette case, and I don't think Jimmy Stewart smokes a cigarette either, does he? I I don't see him. I thought the only person smoking cig, I thought the only person ripping cigs was Lars. Ripping cigs. (laughs) He's doing it over there. He's over there with like a like a cigarillo. Yeah, he's just ripping Um, cigs in the dark. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nothing. Nothing to see here. (laughs) The Lars Thorvald story. Uh, No, I'm going false. I don't think that she. I, I don't think she smoked. I agree with Clint. False. Well, you are correct. It is false, but not for that reason. Uh, there is one scene where she's seen with an unlit cigarette between her lips. Uh, the camera cuts to Stuart, then back to her. She's suddenly holding a lit cigarette, which she sh- soon puts out. Uh, this way, Hitchcock got his smoking scene without ha- Kelly having to that, smoke. That's a real Will Smith of her. He just really needed that yeah. smoking scene, I guess. Yeah, but she didn't smoke. Okay, so. whatever, yeah. Hitch. All right, that's the only... This- uh, guys, we can all agree that while smoking is bad, it looks cool. It looks cool. And looks you can do it in a movie it's... without actually having to make your actors smoke. It, so. it looks cool. Just All you have to do is trick them. Yeah. We um, can all agree that smoking looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all for okay. Torf. Uh, well, then who's your MVP? I mean, what, Hitchcock. Hitch. 
Just Hitchcock. Yeah, sorry. I, mean, Hitch. I wanted to have a more yeah. interesting answer for that, but I don't. It's not Jimmy I think, Stewart. I think you can, what we can all agree. It's <laughs> well, certainly not Jeff. It's not Jeff. It's not it's not LB Jeffries. What a pretentious yeah. name. Um, I uh, I think you can make a case for Robert Burks. Yeah. The more that yeah. I read about how hard this movie was to shoot. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of that was like his work and relationship with Hitchcock was all sort of based around like, let's figure out new ways to do shit. Um, so I think that they were kind of in the trenches together in that respect. But um, but I, I mean, he's the only other one that comes close yeah. to, to doing it. But like it's Hitchcock. It's Hitchcock. It's Hitch all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else is great. <laughs> it's not Hitchcock. Stop. What do we do? Where do they come? Okay. Well, then let's move on to our uh, final uh, segment, Cal, if you please. So, if this movie was remade at any time, who would Nicolas Cage be? I feel like there's an obvious answer for this. Yeah. Thorwald? Yeah. Yeah. Lars. Yeah, Lars. Oh, I want him as Jeff. That's I the other answer. Yeah. Give me give me mid 2000s Nick Cage. Like right smack between like adaptation and national treasure. Like cuz he's he's out there winning awards and he's talented but also he's like carrying blockbusters and like actiony like commercial so you, popcorn stuff. So you want you want Give me give me that that Nick Cage as Jeffries, and I think it's great. So if we're going to go with Nick Cage as Jeffries, I want Red Rock West Nick Cage as Jeffries. So like... So younger Yeah, Jeffries. like mid-90s. Because I mean like, <laughs> Jeffries... He- I think you got to give him... I think you got to give him a little bit of age though because then he doesn't... I, In all of our talk about how Jeff sucks, I do think that Jeff sucking is... Is a is a good thing for the move for the movie for some, like it's an interesting thing. So like I in order for for him to suck, uh, aging him up a little bit and have him and so to the point where he's an older guy that's still hemming and hawing about marriage, um, I think makes him suck just in a, in a, in just a, a sort of mildly tweaked way that is. But could he not? More could he not suck? in his mid thirties as hard as he could suck in his early forties. Uh, you could, but I think, listen, uh, as, as the only three of us in, in the, their early forties, it's a different kind of suck <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And I can, can <laughs> confirm. I suck differently now than I did five years ago. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, yeah, he is, he is suckier because he's, in his 40s. No, I think you need that. I think yep. you need that. Now I'm going on like a whole different tangent in my head that has nothing to do with Nick Cage. If if he it would be better if he was younger, uh, it'd be different. I don't know if he'd be better. Cause like could- I don't think it would. I mean, I think I think that changes the character. Because I if think he's it does, a young yeah. guy that's still if he's a young guy that like he's 46 and he's like had all of these crazy adventures. He was a war photographer. He's been like blown up on a racetrack apparently. And he's got a cast and like. He's done his travels. Like there's not, there are no more worlds for him to conquer in terms of like, I got to go out and live my life. You know, like he's, he's done all that stuff. A younger guy hasn't done all that stuff and there's still more runway ahead of him than there is behind him. But once you start to get to middle age, like I think that makes him suck a little bit more. I agree. You know, I agree with that read. Yeah. I, like, cause I keep on, th- Good. I, I keep on thinking like, could he suck in a way that like uh, Jeremy Renner sucked in uh, the, um, hurt locker oh you know like where mm. like he just kind of like gets back and like the malaise of like you remember like that the feelings of like him yeah. walking through the grocery store just being like my life is fucking boring because i'm just not like juiced up on adrenaline from trying to like defuse a bomb mm-hmm. like could that right. kind of energy uh, that kind of younger energy be brought to an lb jeffries and have it suck- yeah, i think that's a that's an understandable energy given the circumstances that the Hurt Locker presented. Yeah. But like, I feel like, I feel like a, a middle-aged photographer who's still just like, send me out on my next thing. Like, you know, stop it, man. Just, you suck. Yeah. I mean, at least he's not like Brian Williams, like lying about being on a helicopter under attack in like the Iraq war. <laughs> at least he's not Brian Williams, we can always say. <laughs> at least he's not Brian Williams. Yeah. I think I think we could have said that about every movie we've talked about so far. Uh, but, I, but to, to 
counterpoint, I, I think he would actually, a, a lot of times when we do these, these, cage segments i like i'm reluctantly picking someone knowing that it wouldn't be better with cage i actually think he would make a fantastic thorwald and i'm talking today nicholas cage i'm talking current day it's all it's all it's all this it's all face it's it's all silent face Mm -hmm. and at a distance and like nick and flop sweats at a distance yeah yeah being scary just by face i think he would crush it personally Mm -hmm. yeah so that's I'm sticking with that because somebody like uh, oh well, man, see right. now I want to put if if Nick Cage is uh, Jeffrey, can we have Willem Dafoe as Thorvald? <gasps> oh, that really changed a lot Just for me. Actually, Willem Dafoe in a, think, through a telephoto lens, looking at you. I think it's just the Willem Dafoe of it. Dafoe is good. Yeah. Let me ask yeah. you this: Who's Miss Lonely Heart? All right, last one. Who's a Miss Lonely Heart? Yeah, since uh, we, you know, we didn't talk about Miss Lonely we Hearts didn't. enough. That was a that was a storyline that I think it worked on a handful of levels too, right? Like it worked on that uh, Cal, like you were talking about, like here's here's a potential vision of your future, Jeff. You idiot. Yeah. It's a ve- it's um, a very Dickensian then, like ghost of uh, Christmas future. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Miss Miss Lonely Hearts is the ghost of Christmas future. Yeah. Um, and nobody's at your funeral, Jeff. Yeah. Um, you f- but then <laughs> big dummy but then also like the idea that while people are so obsessed about something that literally there are there are other lives happening elsewhere that you are com- completely unrelated to to the point where they like they watched her they watch her get you know uh assaulted yeah. Basically, yeah. she brings that guy home yeah. and he takes advantage and then they watch that happen and they don't even talk about it like they, it clearly the weight of watching that is on them in the rest of that scene but they pivot it to a way to to kind of continue talking about the other thing that they were talking about like they don't really react to it that that much they're like using watching that as new information to talk about the other thing you know um and then they also see her like oh hey look at all those sleeping pills she's about to take and that's honestly let's do something but I'm glad we're talking about it yeah, because that is, yeah. by the way, the reason uh, that Lisa goes to jail because they they stop watching yeah. uh, that scene because they're watching poor Miss Lonely Heart about to kill herself. He, um, yeah. But I will say, not to stretch too hard for the community theme, uh, but one thing that I thought was really sweet about that scene was she's about to do it and she looks out of her window because she can hear the music. That was yeah. like very sweet and tender. And then me. that's, that's, yeah, we get that happy ending for her yeah. where she's like, this song meant so much to me. And she's like, not lonely. Um, you know, I, but yeah. And that's why like to book in this whole, this whole thing with, I do think that there's more interesting stuff going on with, with the community angle in this movie than, than maybe some of the other ones that we've seen. Like, yeah. um, there's commentary, right? Like there's the fact that you can live right on top of each other and still have, and have no idea what people are going through and how, you know, how they live their lives. And if one of them killed their wife or not, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. No. And I, I glad you, I'm glad you brought that up at the top. Cause I, uh, not to compliment Dan, but I wrote that in my notes that I think like, I think this is the most interesting community story. Cause it's the most literal I, it's it's I feel like the an other actual movie, community. Yeah, yeah, it's an actual like I feel like the yeah. other movies we've talked about have been kind of abstract more so yeah, like kind of I don't creating know, your like own community. Seven Samurai has it. No, but that's like, a created community, I think. Like I mean, it's, it's not a town. It's a town, but then you also have the samurai coming yeah. in. Um I think this is very Well, listen, I I can I can tell you that Dan did not do it on purpose, so you don't have to feel Thank bad God. about it giving dan credit <laughs> no but i and i also <laughs> thinking like it's talking about things if that we're gonna kind give of, anybody credit let's give it to tayo tayo yeah yeah <laughs> not dan no. tayo. This, and I'm, Mariah I'm sorry and we keep we keep throwing digs at dan and interrupting your point alex i'm sorry <laughs> no that's that was my intention um no but it's and it's something that hit me harder on a rewatch too because i think when i watched it in college i wasn't living in a big old complex and now i live in a big old complex with giant windows where we're all kind of weirdly intertwined with each other's lives you um, talk to your neighbors i've i've started to have to now that i have a dog which again to bring it back to the basket mm. um but i talk to them a lot more now that i'm always taking my dog out so. you've started to have to yep I, 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 they're nice they're lovely you're not choosing to you have to. i mean <laughs> kind of that is a One little cynical but it's their true. wife you never, you never I would know. say I, I've um, actually intervened and I won't go 
into too much, but I have intervened in some things. I've been a Jeff. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. And you just don't, just don't suck. Yeah. Like yeah exactly. Um, be be better than Jeff. Um, okay, so let's talk about where this movie uh, ranks in the algorithm. Um, I had it at number sixty-eight on my list. Okay. Um, so it's 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 on there. It's not. It didn't narrowly make the list, but it's you know sixty-eight. It's in the sixty-eighth percentile. Where are you at? I feel like the way you looked at me, you know that it's not on my list. It's not on your list? No, and I, I think I was doing a Cal thing. It's not even your second favorite Hitchcock It's not, and I, I was like, I got two Hitchcocks. Do I need, I mean, spoilers, right. but I'm like, I got two Hitchcocks, do I need a third? I don't well, know. Listen, at least yeah, you're not Tanner yeah, just trying to argue that this isn't no, S-tier no. Hitchcock. <laughs> Oh, that B tier Hitchcock yeah. movie, Rear Window. I, I acknowledge that it does Cal, a lot of Hitchcock things amazingly. It's just not, as you were saying at the beginning, Clint, it's not my particular flavor. That Clint, I'm is this your highest yeah. ranked Hitchcock? Uh, let me check real quick. I can also tell you uh, that Dan, Dan, I'm told, had it at number 33. So he had it pretty high up. Cal, where did you have it? I'll go check mine. I out. have it at 13. I, wow. I love this movie. That's up there. Yeah, it's yeah, you do. It's very. Is high. that your highest Hitchcock? Absolutely. Yeah. Without question, I'm um, trying to see where my next Hitchcock comes in. Yeah, well, without saying where it ranks, I can say no, it's not my highest ranking okay. Hitchcock movie. Um, without saying where it's ranked or what it is. Yeah, my but I do my think next highest Hitchcock uh, is 54. Yeah. I've got some high. I I think. My number one Hitchcock is fairly high, but it's not Rear Window. Hmm. Okay. Well, there you, go. there you go. There you have it. You know, that's that's what we call a deep tease to a future episode. Thumbs the brakes. Uh, oh yeah. We'll talk about another Hitchcock movie, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, Cal, you had it at 13. Dan had it at 33. I had it at 68. Alex abstains courteously. Uh, what, what is that? We got an envelope there. Where does that leave it? It's gotta be somewhere in the yeah, middle, right? An, somewhere like, we got, we got an envelope right here, right? All right, here we go. I think it's gotta be where, 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 upper, where are your guesses? Where like you, top quarter you, probably. I'm thinking right? 60s. I'm thinking so uh, maybe 40s. If it ended up on, in the thirties, I'm going to, if it ended 40s. up on three of our yeah, lists, I'm, in the 30s. I'm going higher than that. I'll, I'll go prices, right? Rules is number one. Um, lowest without going it's, over. It's, yeah. Oh, you know what? Do we, cause it's on three lists. That must so mean I think a lot. Gotta, it's gotta get bonus. No, you're right. You're right. Because being on four, because Terminator Two being on four list got in the top ten. Yeah, so I'm gonna put this in. The, I'm gonna put this around <laughs> yeah, thirty. Got it. Mysteri ambiguously mysteriously in the top, in the top 10. ten. Oh, maybe I'm sticking with forties. I, I don't want to second guess myself. Forties. All right. Clint, you sir. Are, I mean, are you about to tell me that I have some some uncanny insight into Dan's algorithm? You sir are the lowest without going over. It is eighteen. 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 Damn. 18. Okay, so being Man, on multiple gets some lists gets a crazy bonus big points bonus. on three yeah. lists. Yeah. Listen, this movie deserves it. 13, this deserves 33, and every number that it's got. This is a I absolute don't, classic. That feels a little high, but I'm, I'm not upset. Well, have we had a... Because Terminator was on all four of our lists. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was on all four of our lists. Have we had a, a, a threefer? So we just have to ask. I have to ask the question. No. You want to strike this from the list? I don't know. It wasn't even on my list, and I don't want to say no. strike. You strike. No, this. no. We can just we can, we just, can just lose that formality. Yeah. Is it, it? I'll tell you what. We'll spin it the other way, Alex. Or if at some point, if we revisit these lists, are you going to add it? So. Is it going to get the Sunset Boulevard? I I've not not thought about it because uh, there's a couple movies that I've really <laughs> kicked myself over, as you mentioned, Sunset Boulevard. Um, I I. It's not one that I feel bad about just because I have other Hitchcock representation on my list. Sure. Um, maybe. If I did, it would be probably low or high or in, you know. Uh, yeah. But maybe. Maybe. Right? Yeah. Not closing the door. Not closing the door, not uh, yet. Well, in the, meantime, in the meantime, I have been informed uh, that uh, we have had a couple of threefers. RoboCop and Star Wars also wow. showed up. Uh, and the third man also showed up on three lists. Oh, we've got a lot of three firsts. I stand corrected. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the three quarters of us are all high fiving about this one. Wait, but who that abstained will... from Star Wars? I don't remember that. Probably Dan. Probably Dan. Um, 
But that'll do it for us this week. Thank you for joining our lecture on why Jeff sucks. Um, <laughs> but Rear Window does not. Uh, thank you for revisiting Rear Window with me, guys. I know it was a real chore. Uh, thanks to producer and our lead TORF engineer, Tayo Yake and Jamie Parslow, our DP, who lent me his very longest telephoto lens for this episode. Uh, thanks to Marian Franzen, who always tells it like it is when it comes to murder. And zero thanks once again to Dan, who didn't believe us for the entire movie until the end. Uh, and even then, it wasn't until we got thrown out of the window. So it's too little, too late, Dan. Thank you for nothing. No thank you, in fact. But come back next week when we'll be sticking around creepy little neighborhoods with the Burbs. Uh, another, it like Disturbia, sort of remake of Rear Window. <laughs> That's a fun double feature, actually. I didn't realize. I know, yeah. I know. Rear Window and the Burbs. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm going to go ahead and blow a tour for the next episode, but the Burbs did actually start out as a spoof of Rear Window before That's it hilarious. kind of came its own thing. Yeah, the original title, I think, was Bay Window. Um, but listen, sorry uh, sorry for, for ruining one of those tours, Tayo, uh, a whole episode early. But in the meantime, stay safe, be good. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks.